Um, hello everyone, I'm Anuj Nakade and you're watching Live Law. Many of you would know that the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill has been passed by the Parliament on the 9th of August. And we thought a person who is better equipped to explain the bill, what laws it brings and concerns about it should be given the platform. So I welcome Advocate Apar Gupta. Uh, Advocate Gupta has been involved in multiple constitutional cases regarding civil liberties on the internet including Shreya Singhal versus Union of India, which struck down Section 66A of the IT Act 2000 for having a very broad applicability by featuring the word offensive, among other things, and the Aadhaar judgment, where the Supreme Court upheld the right to privacy as a fundamental right and a part of right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution. He also co-founded Internet Freedom Foundation, an NGO that advocates for digital rights and liberty and tax blocking of websites technology-related free speech violations, internet shutdowns, and so on. So, Abhar Gupta, welcome to Live Law. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, we took some liberties with your intro. If you'd like to add other things, you we no, no, that's, do welcome that's you. Fine. No, no, no. It's whatever fits in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Right. Uh, before we begin the interview, I would just like to state the objective of the interview, which is uh, that digital rights and following the jurisprudence around data protection is something we believe you have experience with. And data disclosure and civil liberties around the internet is why I would like to explain the digital personal data protection bill. And of course, any concerns you may have about the bill. Shall we begin? Yes, please. Please. Yeah. So I want to start with what is the data protection bill? Because okay. that is the fundamental question. The, the statement of object and reasons, which will be on the screen when we uh publish this video is that uh, it is to provide protection of digital personal data lay down grounds for processing personal data place general and special obligations on persons who process personal data and provide certain rights and so on so can you explain to us beyond the statement what is what the bill is and of course the internet has been around for a while so have there been previous attempts or laws that can answer to these goals of the government uh, Anush, thank you so much for having me here. The first thing which lawyers need to conceptually understand is that when the Supreme Court reaffirmed the fundamental right to privacy in the Putuswami judgment August six years back, Justice Chandrachud's opinion, which was co-signed by, I think so, uh, three other judges besides him, uh, four in total, uh, out of a nine-judge bench, uh, had stated that the right to privacy is both a negative restriction in the sense that it limits the power of the state in terms of what it may want to do, but it is also a positive obligation in terms of ensuring that it brings out acts of legislation, which is one of the primary methods to which rights can also be protected through action of legislatures. Now, this in the sense of protecting informational privacy, which is one of the subcomponents of privacy by itself, is what takes the form and shape of a data protection bill. And yes, of course, there have been attempts at a data protection bill. The One of the most uh, uh, earliest ones is uh, the one in 2011 started by the Department of Personnel and Pensions, which was at that time called a privacy bill, actually. And this law, which has been passed by the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha yesterday, uh, which is on August 9th, uh, is essentially attempting to give effect to the Puttaswami judgment, but does not end up actually doing that as we'll come to um, when we do our analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's just get right into it because there are four concepts I think we should start uh, yes. and explain from the beginning because they seem to be the introduction of this bill in some ways. So can you quickly help us understand what is the data protection board? What is a consent manager, a data fiduciary, and a data principal? Um, also, if you feel like there's other concepts you'd like to include in this list, please feel free to. Thank you so much. I think it's very important for first people to know that, especially lawyers, to know what are the stakeholders or what are the entities which are mentioned with respect to what are their rights and duties under this law. And I think it all starts with the... Uh, with the description of what is called as a data principle, which is in 
uh, sub clause J of section two, which is the definitions clause by itself. And it states that the data principle means the individual to whom the personal data relates and where such individual is a child, includes the parents or lawful guardians of such a child and sub clause two is a person with disability including her lawful guardian acting on her behalf so what we should understand is that the person from whom their personal data is being collected is the data principle so the impacted person and it is usually an individual so it won't be an artificial ent entity it will be a natural person now who is the, which are the entities which hold this data? These are the second category of stakeholder groups. And that includes the data fiduciary and the data processor. These are two, okay? So sub clause, sub clause I states, the data fiduciary means any person who alone or in conjunction with other person determines the purpose and means of processing of personal data. It is somebody who's taken the data from you in that sense and is responsible because the word which is used here in the definition is fiduciary, just like a bank. Okay. And data processor, which is further defined in sub clause K means any person who processes personal data on behalf of a data fiduciary. It means Data principle, data taken by a data fiduciary, data processor does the activity as per a specified purpose, okay? And the consent manager comes a little before in the definitions clause in sub clause G, which means a person registered with the board, which board we'll just come to in a second, who acts as a single point of contact to enable a data principal to give, manage, review, and withdraw her consent through an accessible, transparent, and interoperable platform. What that essentially means, a new entity will be created. You are a data principal. Every time your data is requested by a new data fiduciary or a data fiduciary which already has your personal data wants to put it to a new purpose and that will be done by a data processor which actually does the computing or does the actual performance of that act that will be managed by an intermediary and that intermediary will be called a consent manager quite simply on your smartphone you will have the ability in a single dashboard as per the intention of this law to manage your consent across different data fiduciaries with one consent manager or two consent managers in that sense, right? And uh, it like, but it says a single point of contact in that sense. So I, I would uh, uh, I would think that while there may be multiple, uh, multiple consent managers, a person will essentially only have to install one consent manager, all the data fiduciaries, for instance, your smartphone applications, et cetera, will all link to that consent manager. And of course, those applications which have taken your consent may also be relying on third parties, data processors to uh, undertake that activity. So these are the entities broadly in terms of the rights and obligations which are identified within beyond the, uh, 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 beyond the administration of the law by itself. Now, the law essentially envisages that consent-based sharing will be done. That's become obvious. Now, what happens when that consent is in fact breached is called a data breach, okay? And a data breach by itself is defined fairly, fairly broadly, okay? And uh, it states that there's a authority also established for the purposes of adjudicating of a personal data breach. So firstly, what is a personal data breach? It's in sub clause U, which says personal data breach means any unauthorized processing of personal data, accidental disclosure, acquisition, sharing, use, alteration, destruction, or loss of access to personal data that compromises the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of personal data. That's sub clause U. Now, who do you go to for remedy? That's the data, uh, personal data protection board. Okay. So that's essentially the framework which has been provided under this law for data principles. That's you and me. When we give our data to a data fiduciary, which then in turn, on the basis of the purpose of the consent, gives it to a data processor, which then does the activity. And this consent is managed by a consent manager. In case that consent is broken, there's a personal data breach, you approach a data protection board and you file a complaint for remedy. So this, I hope, clearly sets out what are the entities which are being created by this law. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you for that. Uh, now that we've understood that, I want to circle back to what you said. Essentially, consent is at the center of, of this bill yes. in some ways. And uh, what 
I, I would just like to provide context for consent. A lot of us know what consent is in the regular parlance and how it's imp uh, important in the context of the bill is what we'd like to know. So uh, actually consent uh, is a very old practice which essentially emerges from the patient practitioner context. For instance, if I want, and in fact, one of the first books on the theory and practice of consent was with respect to how people who are being uh, subjected to any kind of medical process or procedure are made aware of the risks as well as the specific purpose for this they are consenting that their body is being operated on, which is very important. And what's the first important thing in that for you to be put to notice for you to be told why the procedure is being done and then you have a choice to examine so for instance if you go to a hospital you say i'm suffering from a ailment or b ailment the doctor says that this is a procedure we will like to perform these will be the risks would you consent and you remember you find a, a sign a consent form so similarly under this law there are provisions for notice consent but there are very, very wide and broad exemptions which are provided, which essentially renders this consent meaningless, both from the public and the private sector, where certain specific uses by itself, which was called earlier the deemed consent provision, but is now called certain legitimate uses under clause seven are exempted from taking consent in the first instance itself. And you may ask Apar, what are these purposes like? So for instance, if you look at clause seven, and you look at, uh, you know, like uh, just in terms of uh, subclause F or G, it says that no consent will be required uh, if there is, uh, let's say, an epidemic or an outbreak of disease for gathering your data. We've all been through the COVID pandemic. What this essentially means, the government does not need to put to notice that they are going to use your personal data or provide you the option subsequent to that, that you can say that, please do not gather my personal data. And this may be your medical records just because there is an epidemic under the National Disaster Management Act as COVID was, right? Mm -hmm. The second exemption here I'd like to highlight just for a second, just to highlight that consent is broadly rendered meaningless is that it is exempt for the purposes of employment or for safeguarding the employer, et cetera, et cetera, classified information, or for the provision of any service or benefit sought by the data principal who is an employee. What this essentially means is that there is a free pass given to any employer with respect to an employee in terms of gathering their personal information. And they also do not need to put that employee to notice that they are again gathering their personal data. And here the public sector or the government is essentially the largest employer of people in India, which would mm -hmm. include, I would imagine, school teachers to people who are employed on our airports to everyone, uh, more or less. So I, so the range of exemptions just here, just in section seven by itself, I mean, I'm not mentioning the other exemptions which follow later, is very, very broad. So Anuj, as much as consent is a central feature of data protection legislations, this exemption of certain legitimate uses where consent is presupposed is in fact at variance with several international data protection statutes. Okay. Uh, I'm glad that you brought up the exemptions because that was my next question. It flowed from uh, um, a post I saw on the Internet Freedom Foundation uh, Instagram page and the post voices concerns about the bill, about four concerns, which uh, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, and uh, now I want to follow up on the last thing you said that it is it it differs from some of the more some of the other international legislations on this topic. Could you just yeah. expand on that for just a minute? So the first thing I'd like to mention is that we have never seen, and I think I I will be supported even by people who may support this law, just on the small objective fact that data protection statutes do not impose duties in terms of penal action for breaches on data principles, which is ordinary people who are sought to be protected by this law. So if you look at clause 15, which contains duties of data principles by itself, it states several duties which are applicable to you and me under this law. So it's not only a protection law, it's providing you a positive obligation as an ordinary person 
to comply with provisions of all applicable laws for the time being in force while exercising rights under the provisions of this act. So even if there's a small breach under any other law, municipal or otherwise, but you're exercising your rights under this law for consent, for notice, for correction, etc., etc., for access to your data, but you're in uh, non-compliance with even one small piece of law anywhere, it disentitles you from the scope of protection of this law completely. But that does not end there. Clause B says you cannot impersonate another person, which also means you cannot mark in proxy for people who may be somewhat disabled as much as data principles can be people who are disabled and somebody else stands for them. They cannot. Sometimes that level of disability is not formal. For instance, our uh, parents or people who are aged uh, lack digital literacy by itself. So that may be a ground in terms of bad faith of presuming that a person is impersonating another person. What is more, most concerning according to me is that a person is under positive duty not to suppress any material information while providing her personal data for any document, unique identifier, proof of identity or proof of address issued by the state or any of its instrumentalities. Which means that even if a private company asks you for certain contact details and you do not wish to give it, and quite often people do give inaccurate details or incomplete details because they are at different levels of threat or sensitivity. For instance, young women who may be working professionals or may be interacting with the gig economy may not give their full address particulars or their unique identifiers given that they may run the risk of uh, any kind of uh, stalking, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But all of these positive duties by itself are very clear in terms of being a complete outlier from any other data protection globally. And what is the consequence, you may ask, Apar, if uh, there's a breach of these duties? And that's provided in the schedule. And it says that a fine of 10,000 rupees may be imposed for breach of uh, duties observed under Section 15, which is uh, item serial number 5 in the schedule. So... Essentially, for each breach, a person may be put to penalty. And of course, there's also a provision in the duties under Clause 15 that you can't file a false or frivolous complaint with the Data Protection Board. So it means that quite often people who may not have uh, the investigative capacity or may not have all the evidence and their complaints may be dismissed by the Data Protection Board, they may also be facing a greater amount of injury. So... Several other features also of this data protection law are very, very outstanding in the sense that they don't have any comparable uh, reference points in um, other data protection legislations. For instance, exemptions to private companies, which may be done as a feature much more of industrial policy rather than data protection. And that's there in Clause 17. And if you look at Clause 17, of course, uh, exemption for government entities is broad, but what, what's truly, truly surprising for me is that the government can also by notification exempt, you know, like uh, companies, class of companies completely. So it says that um, in uh, uh, subclause three, the central government under 17, the central government may having regard to the volume and nature and lawyers may notice it doesn't say high volume or low volume. It's, it's completely vague. It doesn't specify the form of the nature. Um, it can be a nature of anything, right? So just pick up the dictionary. So it says that having regard to the volume and nature of personal data processed, notify certain data fiduciaries or class of data fiduciaries including startups. So not only startups, it may be a data fiduciary, which may be one company. It may be a class of data fiduciaries, which means multiple companies or and a startup. So it's an inclusive category. So they'll be exempted from the consent provisions and large compliances under this law. So this is why I think that uh, not only is this law very different from what we see in data protection statutes, and I would encourage, given that lawyers may want to say that, Apar, what is the basis of you seeing this? I would say, please look at uh, uh, Australian academics work. His name is Graham Greenleaf, and he's done a comparative view of data protection legislations globally, right? And you will not see these features in any of his writing. And in fact, he's engaged with an earlier expert committee also set up by the Indian government, by the Ministry of Electronics and IT, and sent submissions there. 
uh, which was the Justice B. N. Shri Krishna Committee. So this law is an outlier, and I am uh, I I regret to say not in a good way. Okay, um, I I'm sure we could provide the literature that that you just referred to uh, in a link in the this description. S S R N page. Uh, I'll just send you a link. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, we can do that after the interview, Gus. <laughs> Uh, now, now that my last question has flowed into the third co concern, which is duties and penalties, uh, I, is there any more that you'd like to add to the duties and penalties, or was that exhaustive? Because it sounded. I, I, I think that's the, the, that's a lot by itself. That's yeah. A lot. Okay. So the last concern is what's gathered a lot of uh, attention because Anjali Bhardwaj uh, on on Desh Bhakt did an entire takeover episode where she talked about the exemptions that this act uh, brings to uh, like changes it brings to the right to information act yes so the amendment that it introduces can you please explain to us what was the law before and what does the amendment bring to section 81j okay so essentially the right to information act has a body of exemptions and one of the body uh, within that body of exemptions, like you can of course seek uh, information from a public authority and the Right to Information Act has been a transformational law in bringing together accountability, which means that if a uh, road is uh, broken in front of your house, but the municipal department says that it's been relayed or uh, especially for people who are on substances, subsistence and support from the state by itself in terms of employment guarantees pensions, rations, um, uh, subsidies of different types. They, this forces a kind of accountability in a real tangible sense in that way. So the right to information law has, of course, it's not absolute. It has a very well fine-tuned balance of exemptions. And these exemptions also include the right to privacy under Section 81J. Section 81J actually has been very actively litigated right up to the Supreme Court and has been a section which, as per Transparency Act advocates, and I agree with them, uh, has been used to essentially as the ground to limit public information despite the intention of Section 81J. So what does 81J say? It does not only say that any information which is private is exempt and cannot be provided under an application made for right to information. It also says the, the refusal of the provision of the information has to be balanced or is subservient to public interest, which means privacy is a consideration under the Right to Information Act. However, under a correct statutory reading, public interest takes a higher footing to it so they need to be uh, they need to be balanced in a way in which there's a higher degree of value provided section 81j has been litigated quite often people can see it and read about it more but what does this law do this law which arguably does not provide you consent centralizes an immense amount of data gathering power with the government okay also mm -hmm. has the power to then exempt private companies thereby uh, what many people say is not providing you a real meaningful sense of transparency also amends section 81j of the RTI Act and I'll just read it once. So what it does is it replaces uh, 81j completely with uh, one single sentence uh, where it says that uh, the, 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 the information which relates to personal information. So it, section 8 says this kind of information cannot be provided. And then mm -hmm. now the fresh 81J says that information which relates to personal information. What do you notice? Public interest as a ground no longer exists. Thereby, what ends up happening is that section 81J will now not have that balancing any longer. It will be used in a very oppressive manner to limit flow of public information, thereby have a real tangible harm a lot of people, possibly the most vulnerable sections of our society. Even beyond that, I think a core feature of criticism of this law is that uh, it doesn't have a regulatory body per se, right? A lot of the enforcement under very vague standards will be determined as per notifications by the central government, which also ends up appointing the Data Protection Board under Section 18. So, uh, I, I, and the central government can also demand information under this law, not only from the Data Protection Board, but can also recommend suo moto complaints to it, 
for breaches of data. So what I think is also conceptually important to understand is that there's so much control for the enforcement of the statute by the central government, not only in terms of notifications and standard setting, but also in terms of complaints. So imagine that now you don't have a right to information law, which can have that balancing of public interest some way or the other public document, which is not also covered by the Official Secrets Act, is made available to a journalist or to a person who works in the transparency movements towards forcing a greater degree of accountability. The central government can file a complaint to the Data Protection Board, which lacks independence, is appointed by it. Its service conditions to, will be determined by the central government. And essentially, that will be a pure conflict of interest in that sense. Uh, I think in several several deep ways, injuries have been called by the Dis Digital da Data Pro uh, Protection uh, Act. Uh, and uh, it's not only to privacy, it's uh, also to transparency. Okay, that that's uh, all the questions I had about. If there's anything else you'd like to add either to the concerns or to a broad base of understanding the digital personal rights, uh, personal rights, personal data protection bill. I apologize. Uh, you can say them right now. We would like to platform them for, for sure. Uh, what I'd uh, especially like lawyers to consider is that the digital data protection bill uh, is uh, flowing uh, in some ways uh, in accordance with the judgment in so many words of the Puttaswamy judgment as well. And if one looks at Puttaswamy 2, and especially, I know it's a dissenting opinion of Justice Chandra Chud, he highlights, especially in the context of informational privacy and the way personal data is gathered by the government by itself, the state, it has an enormous amount of control over ordinary Indians, which without a proper regulation, that kind of power will be antithetical to a democratic framework as well as the constitution of India. The right to privacy links to all our fundamental rights, as much as informational privacy links to all our fundamental rights. What we eat, what we wear, what we think, who we talk to. And I think this law, especially uh, for, for, for in terms of how it orders people, their relationships, uh, it's very, very important. I believe that this law which has been passed by parliament requires considerable uh, improvement. Uh, and I hope that lawyers over a period of time through their analysis, critique and activism can help uh, refine it in future. Okay. Um, I'm sure that people who are not lawyers also will be watching this video. I hope you are with us at this point of 30 minutes into the interview. And um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gupta, for making time for this interview. Thank you so much, Anuj, for having me here. That's all we have for you in this video. Uh, the Internet Freedom Foundation provides information about digital rights and issues around the internet governance on Instagram and on their website. And we encourage you to see their work for yourself. There will be a link in the description for the same. If you found this video informative, please leave a like and tell us in the comments how we can bring you more interviews like this one. If you'd like to support uh, the work we do here, please consider becoming a member of the Live Law YouTube channel for only rupees 89 per month. And please consider subscribing to our channel and hit the bell icon for notifications. Thank you. Thank you, Anuj, so much.